there is also a lot more of a mental and body, a body mental connection and a way to mentally manipulate your body than most people, especially here in the West, know. A lot of people in the East have been using a lot of these techniques for, you know, thousands of years. But, um, you know, it's fairly new to, to the West. But, um, yeah, these, I've heard of these concepts. I didn't, uh, I'm not familiar with that person, though. Okay, um, who is the negative race that keep coming in people's houses and paralyzing them? Who is the what? Uh, it's a negative race that keep coming in people's houses and paralyzing. <clears throat> a lot of people have been coming up and said, I've been paralyzed mm -hmm. multiple times. Right, and the skeptics say it's sleep paralysis, no. you know, which no. does occur. But, uh, you know, even in our programs, when they go down to uh, like a neighborhood, they will uh, delta wave the neighborhood. They'll put everyone into a, a, a deep uh, state, a, a lower state of consciousness that, you know, is uh, one of the states of sleep. You know, that's why if, you know, if you awake during one of those situations, no matter what you do, you cannot wake up the person next to you if you're not affected by it. Now, a lot of these technologies used not only by humans in these programs, but different non-terrestrial groups, it is very easy for them to cause you to, um, to, to affect your neurology remotely to not only give you sleep paralysis, but to make you get up walk out the door, open the door, close the door behind you, walk down the street, almost like you're, you know, I mean, literally remote controlling you. Their technology is so much more advanced and they understand the, the mind-body connection. Uh, I'm not really familiar with people wearing the, I mean, just that description of wearing black clothes. Um, a lot of the times, um, the, um, uh, if a person is abducted by a non-terrestrial, they will be brought, you know, after they're brought back, they are re-abbed, re, re by the military and it advanced, uh, uh, with advanced technology. The, the, uh, and they have a much messier way of, uh, of messing with our memories when they're done. And a lot of these people are people that, uh, that you know, they'll wear uh, alien-type costumes. They'll wear uh, all black. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it could, it could be anywhere from an ET group to uh, a, a military group. I have a question about the Schumann residence that's been going up lately. Um, you know, the highest it ever went was like 36, and then over Easter it hit like 90. Um, is that also helping with the ascension and with our, with our uh, evolution? Well, if indeed the Schumann resonance is fluctuating, and I've talked to a few people in the programs that debate that, some of them say that it's not. But um, the feedback that I've been talking about, our star system traveling through this different part of the galaxy through this, basically it's an interstellar high energy dust cloud. And the energy is, since the star is like a torsion field, the energy is wrapping around the north and south poles, going in through the, like the top and bottom, but it feeds out through our star. The, the energy feeds out through our star into our system. That's why all the different planets, the temperatures have been raising, on, on, you know, there's not just uh, global warming. We have many different, you know, it's solar system warming. So I believe this energetic change is going to, you know, affect, you know, possibly the Schumann resonance, but, you know, definitely um, part of the EM field that we don't, we can't easily measure. Um. Anyway, I listened to both of your interviews, uh, co-interviews with Cobra, and I was really fascinated. Thank you for that. And I'm really curious, Cobra talks quite a bit about these archons who are supposedly running the show, 
And I've heard the whole Anunnaki story, not just with David Wilcox, but Barbara Marciniak, and you're probably familiar with the Anunnaki. My question is, who or what are these archons, and are they related at all to the Anunnaki? Are they one and the same? Can you, do you have any knowledge about who these archons are, and are they related to the so-called Anunnaki? Thank you. Well, you know, I, I hear, you know, archons, the jinn, all, a lot of different terms, but um, there have been etheric type beings, as strange as it sounds, that um, people using different forms of black magic and also technologies have caused basically tears between these different dimensions, not densities but realities. And what Tyr Air told me is that these beings, these disembodied beings that uh, are controlled through, um, their, through contracts, they'll get a certain amount of loose if they uh, follow, you know, if, if you know, they follow uh, the lead of one of these dark magicians. Um, I was told that when we have this solar event, that it'll change the energy or the vibratory energy of our solar system in a way that these beings won't allow, will not be able to be here anymore. He stated that they will be pushed back somewhere called the outer realm. And I'm, I am definitely not a, a scholar when it comes to all the different gen archons and all of that. So, but that's, you know, that's the best ex explanation I have. Hi, Corey. Hello. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you're doing. But my question is about the ancient builder race. So f correct me if I'm mistaken, but from what I understand, they're a feline race. Um, but also, how do they fit in with the Sphere Being Alliance? Uh, do you know what density they are? Uh, did they ascend into being the Blue Avians or the Sphere Beings? Or I don't know, where are they now? Okay. For, for a number of years in the beginning of the, of the programs, we were coming across very ancient structures in our solar system, on the moon, Mars, various planetoids that were extremely ancient. Not only that, but where we saw that there, at one point glyphs or writing had been, it had been wiped away, much like you know, the, the kings of Egypt would wipe away the history of a competing king or ideology. The information that we have is that this group existed in our solar system 1.8 to like 2.4 billion years ago. What we found out after a, a large amount of time was that we our local stellar neighborhood is made up of approximately 51 or 52 stars. When we started to travel to these different star systems, we were finding out that this ancient builder race technology was spread throughout the whole 52 star cluster. And at one point, they had developed some sort of defense grid to, pr to protect that 52, um, th that local star cluster. At some point, uh, groups with, that were being protected within this grid were warring with each other and they hijacked this technology to use against each other and they inadvertently brought down this protective grid. That's when all of these, uh, what I was uh, told were genetic farmer races came in and began to um, use, I guess, what the most advanced and coveted technology out there is genetics. And they... When was it occurred approximately 500,000 years ago? About the time of the um, uh, was it uh, Tiamat that exploded? That's the information on the glass pads in the program, anyway. Hi, I have a question about the um, the hundredth monkey theory, and that. If about some, what? 
the hundredth monkey? Oh, hundredth monkey. If something were to be um, not true or not mm, correct, I suppose would be the way to put it. Um, oh, sorry. With evolution, um, and a group or a population were to be deceived, would they continue that till the hundredth monkey was also deceived? Is that potentially possible? I'm not quite sure I follow. Um, the the hundredth monkey effect. Are, are you saying that if they get uh, bad information, is the bad information shared amongst the the consciousness? Is that what you're asking? I, I, yes. I'm, uh, yeah, any, any information, um, any and all information is shared amongst us and available to us through our, um, through our group consciousness. And many people have uh, begun to develop the ability to tap into some of the Akashic records and some of the knowledge out there. Uh, yeah, actually, I have a quick question. Um, with all the distractions going on in today with the world and events and those kind of things, are there any new uh, updates with Atlantis and what's happening with that as far as information coming out to kind of subdue things? Or from some of your other talks, uh, have the cabal been cleaned out in these underground bunkers? Like kind of what's the update with that whole situation? Right, the last that I heard uh, that there, um, that they weren't taking out all the underground bunkers, that there were certain bunkers that uh, were built under FEMA but were built for other purposes. Once there was a, um, a change in uh, command when the presidency changed, these certain groups were refusing to, to vacate and they went in and, um, and removed them. As far as um, anything new on Antarctica, I've had a couple of briefings, but they've been basically just about uh, more about the uh, Raytheon type facilities that were built in uh, Antarctica starting in the late 1950s. Uh, if you've seen the video uh, about Project Ice Worm, I believe it's, is it Camp Freedom? That was built in uh, Greenland in the, in the late 1950s. It was a secret base that was built where they were going to put missile silos. Well, this type of um, modular building under the ice was used to build a, a large number of facilities in Antarctica close to some of these recovered craft that were deep under the ice. Um, if you plan on sticking around for David Wilcock, he is going to have a whole presentation on this with much of the... Uh, updated intel, both for myself and Pete Peterson. Hi. <clears throat> um, I wanted to know whether or not you have any information about the following. Um, so at the very beginning of the talk, you started talking about the analogy that you were given regarding uh, the battered wife and the wife beater, as it were. And um, I'm just wondering, in the universe, um, the way you've been shown, is it typical to have, you know, uh, civilizations learn out of atrocities and um, adversarial type of an interaction, or our particular world is a special kind of a basket case? It's definitely a special kind of basket case, um, but from the information that I have, most of the stars in our local star cluster have gone through a very similar process. Most of them have uh, related to us that their problems were nowhere near as significant as ours, but that they had a very similar, I guess, evolution through adversity to get to where they're at. Hi, Corey. Thank you so much for um, sharing your story. Um, I just have a quick question about, um, well, on this week's episode of Cosmic Disclosure, you shared about how you were at, um, you were at, in Boulder at the hotel, and people knocked on the door, yeah. and you had to do these briefings, and the guys walked out. I'm just wondering um, if there's any follow-up on that. Have there been any more opportunities to give briefings? Yeah, interestingly enough, 
while I was on that trip, um, Sigmund, the guy, we're giving the name Sigmund to this, uh, um, he's, he feels higher than a colonel. He, he, doesn't, he never wears uh, any fleer on his uh, uniform. Uh, but uh, he came and talked to me about doing more of these briefings. And he said, for the love of God, do not talk about eight-foot-tall blue birds. <laughs> he said, just talk about the programs and the technology. Don't talk about any of that. And, uh, and he wanted me to not talk about it in public either. And uh, I told him I, I couldn't do that. So, uh, yeah, I had uh, about 13 people get up and just walk out in the middle of me giving this briefing. And uh, the people that did stay had a weird grin on their face like an idiot looking around, you know, jerking their head around, waiting for someone to jump out and say they were punked. <laughs> so th they did not go well. They did not go well, and they've been suspended for now. Corey, um, here. Right here. Oh, okay. Um, so I have no problem with my fear of becoming fully empowered and completely whole and heart open. But I do have a fear, and I was wondering what to do with it, of if I get enough information, I've got a sound healing research foundation, and we're doing research, and we're starting to get more information. What do we do with the fear where we get enough information and enough knowledge and enough um, you know, consciousness that we actually come up against the higher levels of the cabal or of these other beings. You know what I mean? I, I think I do. Mm -hmm. One thing that if you're in this field, don't ask questions that you can't handle the answer to. You know, you need to be prepared. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, what, how can you prepare for what you don't know, though? You know? When we get a lot of information about the, the the, the, you know, we know the main thing that they've been trying to cover up is not that they're ETs, it's, you know, their technology. But think about all the crimes against humanity they have perpetrated against us to keep that secret. That is what they are, they're terrified. They're terrified about that coming out. That's why you hear them talking about, uh, you know, being turned into wind chimes in uh, the middle of D.C. hanging from lampposts. They're really worried about that. Good evening. My name is Amaranta, or in my traditional language, Wautli. I am of Central America in descent, and uh, my direct relatives are from Nahuizalco, El Salvador, Mayan people. And I'm honored that you address the Mayans um, at, in your encounters when you're talking about the beings that you have uh, become familiar with. Um, I've been recognized in my community as given um, privileges to conduct gatherings and do prayers, and we always recognize our star cousins above. Uh, that being said, what can you tell me about these beings that you have encountered? Because uh, I'm sure you're aware, but people in Central American countries have been dispersed because of war, and thus we've been disconnected from our traditions. What can you inform me about? It was related to me that this group, you, the earth has been used as a place for refugees, still, uh, cosmic refugees. They were here for a long period of time as cosmic refugees. And at a certain point, those of them who had not interbred with other, others outside of their group were picked up and, and, and taken, and, and they disappeared. And I was told it was like 40 million of them. When it comes to what I know about them, they, they give me big smiles, but they refuse to interface with me. They'll interface with Gonzalez, and then God, Gonzalez will tell me, you know, what, what they're communicating to him. For, but for some reason, they, they just will not interface with me. He, he is. Um, he is actually part Caucasian and part uh, Latin. Yes. Hi, Corey. My name is Monica. And I wanted to ask about the, the gender imbalance for the extraterrestrials that come here and communicate with humanity. 
when you go into the secret space program or the corporate conglomerate and those high, high levels that are interfacing with these groups, they're very male dominated. And I'm wondering if you've gotten any information or any messages about us balancing that and if that can help us to evolve it or get on a better timeline or, or anything, if you've gotten any information like that. Well, we're a long way away from this, but not only do we need a balance of, well, I guess, equality with women and men, we need balance of the feminine and masculine in each individual. I, I don't know how this is going to occur. If it, I think that, I believe that once we get to a point where we get a disclosure and then stop fighting each other and begin this consciousness renaissance that the process, early process of that consciousness renaissance is going to cause a lot of this balance to kick in. But sadly, I don't see that occurring anytime soon. <clears throat> now, within the programs, I definitely saw women, and they were up underrepresented. But I tell you what, these were some of the most extraordinary people I've ever met in my life. For the women to get into these programs, they were amazing. They were absolutely amazing. So, yes, there is a, in the programs, there's a discrepancy in race, races being represented, as well as uh, males and females. That, uh, that's something that we all have to wrestle with in society as it is, and it shows up on every level. Yeah, I'm so grateful to be here and meet you in person, Corey. Uh, I've been working for 30 years with uh, international scientists to use science as a seeing as believing stepping stone to actually show that we're indivisible on instrument even when we're thousands of miles apart and that the whole of humanity actually can share a commonly sensed intelligence as a species. And I'm wondering if you know other scientists or filmmakers, I'm working on a series of films that shift viewing audiences into unity consciousness by sharing undivided attention in a, a single body, heart, and mind consciously. If there's anyone here or anyone you know that you could put us in touch with to help us collaborate on this uh, worldwide effort, that would be great. That's an excellent uh, point you just brought up. Uh, we've had a couple dry runs at creating, um, we're trying to create a network that will bring people together that want to contribute art or co and contribute in any, any way to putting these projects out there. And we're not looking just to fund or help our own projects. There are plenty of people out there that have projects like your own. We would like to get a kind of a, um, not a forum, but a way for them all to communicate with each other, exchange resources, and uh, help each other find, uh, you know, different types of professionals that you're looking for to assist you, and um, have a, you know, it's part of the unity in the community thing, having a symbiotic relationship to where we're not competing with each other, but we're assisting each other in getting out this message. That's something that we're in the early ages, early stages of attempting to do. And from what I've heard recently, people are doing the same thing. Other people are doing the same thing. Corey, I have two separate but related uh, questions. Oh. One is about um, the sexual abuse phenomenon on the planet. And um, I'm under the impression that this is something that is being, it's a plague that's been given by the reptilians or perhaps another group, and that one of the w methods they use is to manipulate people's timelines so that they retroactively will have experiences of sex abuse. And this is one of the ways of spreading um, the sex abuse on the planet because these beings get food every time somebody is upset by this type of memory. Loosh, yeah. Is that what you... Yeah, the energy that it's referred to as loosh, the loosh. energy that they feed off of or vampire from. So do you know, are, are you aware of this time manipulation abuse that is part of why people can't remember uh, their memories until later or why their family members won't admit it or can't remember it because everybody's in, in different timelines? 
Now, there can be a timeline aspect because there were timeline aspects to the secret space program, overlapping timelines. But in a lot of this training, they use physical and sexual trauma to not create schisms in your psyche, but we naturally want to disassociate from those traumas. So the trauma that we're trying to work on, trying to figure out, it, a lot of times it's just a tool to cause us to compartmentalize that memory. The, there might be a deeper memory behind that terrible experience. That terrible experience was just used as a way to uh, cause you to disassociate and compartmentalize that memory. Right, and I'm talking about the everyday person, that this is just rampant. It's just unbelievable, and I, I just want to name it as an infestation that is not human in origin. Yeah, when um, we do have a full disclosure, all of the um, occultic and uh, uh, sexual abuse stuff, when that stuff comes out, that's, that's going to be one of the things that... Uh, uh, causes us to, a lot of us to hang these people from light posts. Okay, and my second question is, I'm under the impression that this rash of people, children on the spectrum, Asperger's and, and autism, is um, gray alien abduction of women in pregnancy, and then their children are hybrided. Are you aware of this, or does this resonate for you? I, I have not heard that, um, but there's so much going on in these different um, genetic farmer programs okay. that, I mean, there are 22 main programs that these non-terrestrial groups are performing on humanity, and it's uh, of a genetic nature, but it's also of a spiritual nature. Uh, it's, it's about, to them, it's, they're studying you know, evolution under, in, in different uh, energetic fields from stars and uh, also the evolution of consciousness. So some of the programs are not only of a genetic nature, but they're of a spiritual nature. Some of these beings are agreeing to incarnate down here, I guess star seeds, you could call them, uh, but they are doing so to take part in this grand experiment and to... And a lot of these, a lot of the times, people being abducted are these non-terrestrials are abducting basically their own people who have incarnated here and agreed to it because there, there are laws, cosmic free will laws, that uh, everyone, all of them have to abide by, but they, they all find ways around them. Okay, that's, great. That's one of them. Third and final question for the women in the room, because talk about gender. Can you say more about Car E? because we hear about her from you, but very little. And is there a way that we as women can be in closer contact with her telepathically, or have there been any messages from, from her to you for the women and the priestesses of Earth? Actually, yes. Um, now, one of the things that um, they have been a little disturbed about is how many people are reaching out to them and praying to them, and um, that totally goes against what they're trying to, um, you know, they're trying to get us to become self-empowered and to look inwardly. Now, I've had many people, I've, I've got some uh, really good friends that are uh, priestesses and uh, do that type of training, and uh, many of them have uh, been able to connect with her. So, yes, it's possible. But, you know, keep in mind, you know, the intent of why you're reaching out, you know, because they really want us right now to be focusing within and looking within for, um, for the answers, because that's where they're at. Hi, Corey. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your courage. Uh, my question is around the solar ev uh, event within the next three years. Um, has Raw Tier Air specifically stated what he either knows or feels will occur, is my first question. And the second one is, if he hasn't mentioned or you don't feel he will state what it will be, could it be that um, if we hit the 100 monkey effect, we will get the outcome of everyone raising to a fourth dimension 
basically a good scenario, or if we don't hit the 100 monkey effect, we may get the not so good scenario where we get the uh, electrical shutdown and so forth. Thank you. Right, yeah, if we, um, if we just sit back in, for the ride and not, for lack of a better word, try to manipulate the mass consciousness to go in the right direction, then yeah, we're, we're along for the ride of wherever it goes. Um, now, I'm sorry, what was your first question? Right. <clears throat> Tier Air told me that things are not, we're not sitting back waiting for things to happen. Strangely enough, the entire co creative consciousness of humanity, even the non terrestrials that are in our star system right now, their co creative consciousness, that is what is manipulating and guiding and creating these different realities and timelines. So they can't really say this solar event will happen in three years. They can't, there's a, they, they can't, you know, they have probable futures of what could occur. But we are constantly, through the observer effect, changing things. And that's, you know, that's the point of all of us getting together and focusing on the same intent, is for us to be able to uh, be able to take a hold of the steering wheel and guide, a, guide us to that area. That was both questions, right? I think I answered. Okay. Thanks, Corey. Um, I have two questions. Oh, oh okay. Um, the first is, I was under the impression that um, the reptilians or races that were interfering with our planet were removed after 2012. Um, I've heard different messages from different places and just wanted to get clear on that. Um, it kind of seems like they have been removed because things have been falling apart right. globally. I don't have any information about any particular species being removed. Um, there was a barrier that was created that has prevented uh, um, different groups from coming and going to our star system. Kind of a, uh, uh, I guess, you know, like a, a large field that they, they can't penetrate. I have not heard about any one group being kicked off the earth or out of the solar system at okay. this point. I haven't. It's just not my information. And my second question is, um, I think it was last Friday morning in um, three or four cities across the United States, there was a power outage. Mm. It was like San Francisco, Financial District, um, New York City, I think LA and maybe Dallas. Do you have any comments on that? Um, I haven't, I haven't uh, gotten a, a briefing since that occurred, but I'm fairly certain that that had to, that was um, had to do with the uh, geomagnetic activity between the sun and the earth. I haven't heard anything about there being any type of hacking or anything like that to bring down the grids. But then again, the, I'm speculating here because I haven't been briefed. I haven't. It's been a, it's been a little while since I've been briefed. Hi, Corey. Hey, Foster. I would love for you to address a little more in depth the topic of time. I find it the single most mind-boggling uh, topic for me in my research. And we're working with some, some scientists uh, who are using quantum fields to manipulate uh, the effect of time on matter in a certain sense. They, they can move biological uh, cells, they can advance the aging of them, or they can pause the aging, or they can actually reverse the aging in such a way that cancerous cells go back to their wholeness. So they're, they're affecting a, uh, a biological timeline. But to me, that's not quite the same as traveling in time. And I, I wonder if you know, the classic uh, paradoxes of if you actually go back in time, then maybe your parents didn't meet, and all of a sudden I'd snap out of out of existence and so forth. Is that, a, 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 in your experience, is that a function of moving on different timelines so that it doesn't affect the world? Could you just clarify the time for us? <laughs> clarify time, wow. <laughs> um, now, when I was in the programs, they were manipulating the stages of cells through um, and, and some of them said that they were manipulating them on a quantum level that were basically bringing them forwards and backwards in time for, for that one 
organism, if you will. Now, that organism is not being moved within time, linearly, but what is being occurred is that it's uh, certain fields can be applied that will advance or reverse the state of a, a cell or an organism. And it sounds to me like that is what is occurring instead of them, there actually being a, uh, a temporal field that is being created um, within an electromagnetic temporal field that is being created that is actually creating some sort of time distortion within it. Am I, does that sound right? Or? Well, I've only jumped in time in the way that I covered long distances and an almost instantaneous um, time, time period. Now, these portals that they use, they, if, you know, if you've seen Stargate, you see, you know, it's a flat portal against a wall with, you know, Ripley like a pond. What they have is these things are set up by devices. There'll be three, sometimes four devices around a room pointed to a center point. And what occurs is that when they create this um, portal, it, it creates what looks like a sphere that uh, has a mirage effect to it. If you've seen above the highway, that mirage effect. And the ground seems to sink down in an almost a conical way. People can walk into it from 360 degrees around it, and when they walk in, they get smaller, and it looks like they're walking downhill. And when they, and they come out on the other side at 360 degrees. They would also use these to transport, um, you know, building materials like, you know, large iron beams or something like that. They would put them in the, in the, uh, the floor or on the ground, turn on the field, and the uh, sphere would appear, appear in the middle of the steel beams, and the steel beams would fold up and then go in, almost like they're being sucked in like spaghetti. So that is definitely manipulating time and space in an electromagnetic way. Now, for me to give the description of, you know, what is exactly occurring, I can't. I can tell you how the cosmic web works, how the star, uh, these portals work. Um, there's what we call, you know, the cosmic web. And I'm sure you've seen images of Hubble where they've taken, taken different uh, uh, types of exposures and, and different uh, spectrum images to where you see um, all the different galaxies are connected and it looks like a web. Well, between each of those galaxies, is an electromagnetic filament connection. And being that the correct physics model is nothing like the classical physics, physics model, it's a electroplasmic um, torsion universe. The whole universe is a giant torsion field. A lot of the places where people are thinking they're seeing dark matter, there are torsion fields that are you know, affecting the way light, the way we're seeing light. Now, between each star within a galaxy is this same electromagnetic filament connection. Within each star system, there's an electromagnetic filament connecting to everything in that star system, every planet, every moon. They've learned to calculate all these, these planets, they have grids or ley lines. As the Earth is rotating, and that electromagnetic filament is uh, going deeper, further out, up and down around the Earth as it's spinning, it is activating different nodes. And it, you know, think of you know, the path of least resistance. It's like elect it travels like electricity. And these nodes will, open, uh, will give the ability to open up a portal, will uh, give you a pathway, an entrance. And they found a way to calculate when and where these would open or be available. Sometimes they appear deep underground or under the ocean, at ground level, or even in our upper atmosphere. So 
these, um, they use this hyperdimensional mathematics model to be able to calculate the spin of a planet, how to calculate, and, and they have a code that's much like TCPIP to uh, be able to travel between these different star systems, but they have to calculate as things are, as planets are moving around in our star system, this electromagnetic uh, filament will connect to our moon or uh, be, it'll connect to, uh, you, know, uh, some, you know, some other body in our system. So you have to calculate it just right because it, it works like electricity. It's traveling the path of least resistance. So it's traveling through the sun and uh, whatever node is able to create that connection is, is where the, where the uh, portal is able to be opened. And they've been able to, through the assistance of non-humans, they finally were able to calculate, calculate it in a way that they could send humans and craft through these portals. Before that, uh, it wasn't cal they weren't calibrating it right, and they weren't able to send organics through. They are only able to send equipment through these portals, and they had to use some of the, like, solar warden craft to travel to, to where the uh, uh, materials were delivered. But um, they've, through the help of a non-terrestrial group, we figured out that uh, hyperdimensional mathematics model, which we've applied to many other things, by the way, to be able to successfully uh, uh, go, through, you know, go through all of these different gate systems. Corey, Tom, nice to meet you. Um, question one, when you were doing your 20 and back, and you were having your feast in a replicated food, were you able to eat as much food as you wanted to without gaining weight? <laughs> and if so, can I have one of those uh, machines? Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and, and you, you didn't always eat the food out of the printers. Uh, you would eat out of the galley a lot of the time. Ah, okay. But uh, no, you metabolize the food the same as you do here. Uh, I know David's talked about some that... Um, you eat it and it cleans your teeth and wipes your butt on the way out, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't experience any of that type of food. <laughs> and and uh, second question, um, if, if a big event's going to happen within the next three years, whether it be uh, an ascension level type of event or extinction, whatever the case be, if we're talking 100 years from now that we're going to start doing full disclosure, why are we even having that conversation if the pow powers that are resisting have no leverage or have no reason once this ascension happens or this event happens, why should they even bother? Why should we even be talking about what happens 100 years from now um, for that reason? Because one, they don't have any leverage after that, or two, something happens to where it doesn't matter what we do in 100 years anyways. Yeah, well that, we can't be apathetic we have a lot of different beliefs of what's going to happen in two years, seven years, ten years. But, uh, you know, what happened with, uh, you know, the uh, uh, millennial situation with the computers? You know, nothing happened. Uh, 2012, nothing overtly happened. Something did happen, but it was more of an energetic thing. So two years, three years from now, we have a strong belief that something happens and we kick back and do nothing. Just like a lot of people criticize religious people for doing, you know, instead of going out and saving the world, they kick back saying, oh, no, someone's going to come back and take care of everything. You know, that type of apathy is, is dangerous. So I say we have to pretend as if things are going to keep going as they are now forever, that nothing is going to change unless we are the change. We get out and cause the change. If we get more and more people to show up doing, you know, uh, 50 different cities, doing, you know, you know, 100,000 person marches in all these different cities, you know, and you know, having signs about um, health technologies that have been suppressed. I, I, you know, listen to Foster Gamble. There are a lot of technologies out there that can extend our life and improve our quality of life, but they're being suppressed. Those are things that are available now, and those are the things that we have to demand. They're, no one's going to release them 
they have a hundred year timetable that they're sticking to to start releasing all these different things and uh, if we kick back that's how it's going to work but